to order uh, on the nomination of attorney Brendan J. Moran to the position of clerk magistrate of the Worcester. Well, I thought I had court. my video on already. At a mute, Eileen. I'm going to first introduce our counselors. I have Councillor Terry Kennedy here, Councillor Mar uh, Marilyn Devaney, Councillor Eileen Duff, Councillor Bob Juvenville, Councillor Councillor Chris Ionella. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Councillor and Councillor Mary Hurley, and Councillor Joe Ferreira. I'm next going to read a letter from the governor into the record dated March 31st, 2021. Dear counselors, I am pleased to nominate Brendan J. Moran to the position of clerk magistrate of the Worcester Juvenile Court. I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the executive council pursuant to part two, chapter two of the constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm enclosing the nominee's resume for your convenience. Sincerely, Charles D. Baker. Um, and with that, we're going to start uh, attorney Moran with your witnesses. Sure. So go right ahead. So the 1st witness would be uh, the 1st justice of the Worcester juvenile court, Carol Erskine. And my 2nd witness would be an associate justice of the district court, Patrick J. Malone, former clerk magistrate of the Fitchburg district. Court. Excellent. Um, and so we'll start uh, with judge Erkson, who is joining us remotely, I believe. Um, attorney Moran, maybe we could jump ahead to your second counsel. I mean, second witness while we figure out the, sure. the technical, would that be okay? Of course. The honorable Patrick J. Malone, associate justice of the district court. Take a seat right up there, judge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. It's uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I've been here uh, on two prior occasions, uh, both as uh, when I was looking for a clerk's job and uh, when I was fortunate enough to become an associate justice. And so I'd just like to begin by thanking the council for your support of me in the past. But more importantly, I'm here to talk about my friend, Brendan Moran. I've known Brendan for more than 10 years now. And uh, when I first met Brendan, I met him when he was a lawyer. He appeared before me when I was a clerk, and uh, there were a number of things that came to mind. But most importantly was his demeanor and the way that he cared about his clients. I didn't see Brennan for a period of three or four years, and then after that, his name popped up on a list uh, of interview candidates for an assistant clerk job in Fitchburg. And uh, I was fortunate enough that, that uh, when Brennan was offered that position, that he took that position. And the three years that I worked with Brendan every day, uh, I found him to be such an asset to the clerk's office. His treatment of people, his treatment of staff, his treatment of litigants, the way that he worked with judges um, was just amazing. He was truly second to none to be around every day. He really knows the job, he really understands the job. And in the past year, uh, and, I, and I feel that it's okay to say this, because of being both a clerk and a judge, I would say that over the past year, uh, the clerks have truly been the backbone of the court uh, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, I know the work that Brendan has done in the juvenile court is, uh, is appreciated by all. I know that he has a great relationship with his staff. Uh, he is a guy with integrity. He's a great family man. His wife, Amanda, is here today in his support. He has a beautiful daughter. This is someone who gets it and someone who will do a wonderful job as the clerk magistrate of the juvenile court. You know, there's an old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Everything is going very well in Worcester under Brendan's lead for the last four years. And so I would hope that you will all vote uh, for Brendan after this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll open it to any counselors who have any questions or comments. Counselor. 
nice to see you. Thank you for coming. What a tribute to the nominee to have you come and speak for her. Um, her? her? We we talked about, you know, my philosophy, you hire from within. And you were my prime example. You, you have worked it, you earned it, and you deserved it. So I'm very proud to say that um, you had my full support along the way. So uh, so how long have you known the nominee? So I've known Brendan now for, I'd say, probably about 11 years. Wow. So uh, what, what's, what, what would you say about his demeanor and what he will bring to the bench? So, so Brennan's demeanor, he has, he has a great demeanor, and, and that goes to his treatment of people. Um, and he's a, he's a humble guy who's very intelligent, who's not afraid to make a decision. And so in that role as the uh, clerk magistrate, um, he has that ability to work with people and handle any issue that comes before him on a daily basis. Yeah. So he's not going to sit in the office reading a newspaper. He's going to be at the counter. I can I can <laughs> I can tell you unequivocally that Brett Moran is not someone that sits in the office and reads. Thank you so much. So good to see you. Thank you for coming in person. It's Thank very you. safe here. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Do any other councillors have questions for the witness? Nice to see you too, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you very much, Judge Malone. Do we have the witness available now? Two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Attorney Moran, if, uh, you if call it's okay. Judge with, I'm sorry. She's not available yet, Counselor. She's, there's technical issues getting her connected. Um, so given that, I wonder if you'd be willing to. I, I am connected now. Now we're good. <laughs> So let's hear from uh, the next witness, uh, the Honorable Carol Erkstein. All right, uh, uh, counsels, are you able to hear me okay? We are. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the technical issues are because I can see you all, but um, for whatever reason, the video is not working. But thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak in support of the nomination of Attorney Brendan Moran for Clerk Magistrate of the Worcester County Juvenile Court. Um, I should let you know I've known Attorney Moran for over 15 years when he began his legal career with the Massachusetts Juvenile Court as an exceptionally talented law clerk researching and writing for the juvenile court judges. He chose the juvenile court early on and continued his commitment to the children and families of the Worcester Juvenile Court through his excellent and zealous representation of countless children in both care and protection cases, as well as in delinquency and youthful offender cases. In 2014, he would follow a new path when he was offered a position as assistant clerk magistrate in the Fitchburg District Court. When the Worcester Juvenile Court clerk magistrate retired in 2017 and the Chief Justice sought applications for the acting clerk magistrate, I encouraged Brendan to apply knowing of his commitment to the mission of our court. He came in as acting clerk at a somewhat tumultuous time with our care and protection case numbers increasing dramatically and with a number of policy changes badly needed in the busy clerk's office. His experience as an assistant clerk coupled with his background in litigating juvenile court cases was the perfect combination as he immediately demonstrated that he was a skilled administrator with excellent and compassionate leadership qualities. He set up meetings with staff, he listened to their concerns and grievances, and made immediate policy changes with their input and approval. He then set out to restructure many of the complex procedures for scheduling and docketing multiple case types. He revamped and streamlined courtroom procedures for session clerks. He ushered in new case management systems and seamlessly worked with judges on their individual dockets. Apart from his administrative talents, he immediately embraced the diversion programs we've developed over the years, using them to successfully divert countless juveniles from the court system during show cause hearings. The concept of acting in the best interest of children who come into our court has never been lost on Brendan, 
and he treats everyone who walks through our door from our wonderfully diverse community with kindness, compassion, and respect, whatever their race, ethnicity, or LGBTQ status. Despite being in the position of acting clerk, he embraced our involvement with community stakeholders, volunteering to serve on committees such as the Mayor's Youth Violence Task Force and attending countless meetings that we arranged with school principals, superintendents, DCF, CPCS, to name a few, all while serving as co-chair of our case flow management committee as part of our Chief Justice Nexum's Pathway Initiative. His reputation in our community with the bar is one of incredible respect and admiration for his work, his responsiveness to their needs and concerns, his commitment to our children and families, and certainly for his legal acumen. And that was before the pandemic. When March 18, 2020 exploded into our collective lives, Brendan Moran became a leader with unprecedented talent. For the last year, he has guided our court to the most challenging times we have ever faced. He has provided that guidance as well for the bar and regional stakeholders. His office had to function initially with a skeleton crew and then at 50% for the rest of the year by order of the AOTC, a staffing level still in effect today. He guided us through incredibly restrictive and complex conditions arranging emergency hearings for judges by conference calls for almost three months when we were given Zoom licenses. He, he fielded with staff hundreds of calls every week and sometimes even now as many as 800 emails a week with electronic filings that required docketing and other court process. This continues right to this day. Attorney Moran created a new and separate email system for the bar to file electronically met almost daily with judicial staff to set down procedures as the standing orders from the SJC and AOJC were revised. He put out dozens and dozens of instructive emails and procedures for the bar to follow, follow lobbied for, interviewed, and hired new staff to fill vacancies left by people who retired or were promoted, attended countless meetings with court administrators, participated in bench bar meetings, managed the Zoom licenses, and addressed countless HR issues. As First Justice, I can state unequivocally that we could not have survived this challenging time without his expertise and energy. I could spend hours detailing his accomplishments and the almost endless list of responsibilities he willingly took on during the pandemic without so much as a complaint, often giving up time with his amazing wife and daughter he is indeed a wonderful husband and father, and one of the most even-tempered, calm people I have ever known. Today, he continues to keep our court running with only 50% staffing levels, but with boundless energy and dedication, allowing judges to hear cases that we so badly need to hear in order to ensure the safety of children under our jurisdiction. In the last fiscal year, counselors, we have 2,627 new cases filed in our court and have 1,037 open child abuse and neglect cases with over 2,300 children in substitute care under our jurisdiction. I simply cannot overstate how grateful I am to have Brendan Moran not only as a personal friend, but as a partner in managing our court. And today I ask, along with my judicial colleagues, Judges Keating, Murata, McNulty, and Bolivar, that you confirm his nomination for the position of Clerk Magistrate for the Worcester Juvenile Court. Counselors, thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of Attorney Moran's nomination. Thank you very much, Justice. Are there any counselors who have questions or comments? Counselor today? I don't know where she is. <laughs> um, thank you for your um, your testimony. It it means a lot, and uh, to have all the other justices joining in, that's quite a tribute. Um, tell me, um, you know, you've been confirmed now. How many years is it now? Twenty years this year. Oh my God, 
Wow. And and I was there and you were there. And I was so impressed yeah. and I'm still impressed with your service. Thank you. Um thank you so much. No, it was it it was my honor. I want to ask you, in the twenty years, um, what has been has the the juveniles serious crime increased over these twenty years? What do you find? Well, I think juvenile crime has decreased, um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we use diversion programs when they come in for more minor kinds of cases, and then they never come back into the system because our diversion programs work. Um, I, we had diversion programs in place before um, Brendan was there, and we've developed diversion programs since he was there, including our own, the only diversion in the entire state, which is a domestic violence diversion program where kids become physically aggressive with parents, and we divert them into a three-month program of intensive counseling through a grant by the district attorney's office. And then we, they never get arraigned, they never get a criminal record, and they don't come back. But what we do see in Worcester, unfortunately, is an increase in serious crimes. Our numbers of firearms crimes and dangerousness hearings with shootings and um, kids being in possession of firearms has increased quite dramatically over the past few years. But all in all, we feel like our diversion programs are working well and they're working to, to keep kids out of the system. Well, we're lucky we have you there serving, but you know, when you look back 20 years be when you came before me and the council, um, they didn't have those programs. And you know, they a lot of these juveniles would have had a record and uh, I, I think it's wonderful that they um, have done that. But I thank you for, um, for coming and um, it was great to see you. And um, I, as I said, I, I think it really means a lot to us to hear your testimony for the nominee and for the other justices too. So thank them for me. Nice seeing you. I will. I think that they're, they're trying to, I think many of them are hoping that they could get into the live stream, but they're all here and support him. And he has 100% yeah. support and this means a lot. And thank you, attorney. Um, thank you, Councilor Devaney. I really appreciate all your help as well. No, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any comments or questions from other counselors? There being none, thank you, Justice, for uh, your testimony. Uh, we ver value it very much. Um, and now we'll turn to the nominee, uh, Attorney Moran, if you'd like to introduce the folks you have with you and then share your statement with us. Sure, thank you, Council DePaulo. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to introduce my amazing wife, Amanda. Um, she's the rock, the Wonder Woman of our family. Um, I certainly would not be here today if it was not for her. Uh, I, I'm sure you hear this a lot. Uh, this process takes a lot out of the candidate, but takes just as much out of the candidate's family and spouse. And I can't thank her enough for all that she's done for me. Uh, not only the last year, but certainly the 12 years we've known each other. Um, I also want to introduce the esteemed clerk magistrate of the Suffolk Juvenile Court, Donna Champoli, who um, has been a great source of support for me over the last four years. I, I can't thank her enough for being here today, so thank you. And the last thing I'll, the last person I want to mention who's not here today is the pride and joy of our family, our daughter, Kaylin. Uh, she's nine years old and currently in the fourth grade at Flag Street. And certainly if she was here today, she would most likely be sitting across from me, trying to grill me about my um, discipline practices, certainly over the last year. So uh, we're, we're certainly thinking about Kaylin right now. To the members of the council, good morning. My name is Brendan Moran, and I'm the nominee for the clerk magistrate of the Worcester Juvenile Court. To be in this building in front of this body right now is an extremely humbling experience. To say this is the highlight of my legal career is an understatement. I would like to thank Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito for their faith and trust in nominating me as clerk magistrate. I'd also like to thank attorneys Bob Ross, Lauren Green, Emily Gothier, in addition to Valerie McCarthy for all their help. They've certainly made this process a lot easier. And obviously, I want to thank you, Council DePaulo, and your fellow counselors um, for your service and for uh, reaching out to me and talking with me over the last few weeks. I certainly enjoyed our conversations and having you ask questions and give me an opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. And if I could, I would just like to add a few things that I might not have mentioned to you during our conversations in terms of my life. 
I'm a proud product of Worcester, born and raised. I was one of four children born to Don and Mary Moran, also lifelong residents of Worcester. In fact, they're both third generation residents of Worcester. And they're currently watching this interview at home in the home that I grew up with in, and they'll actually be celebrating their 50th anniversary this weekend. So I just wanna say hi to mom and dad. My dad worked in probation for over 40 years. He was a line PO making his way all the way up to a statewide supervisor. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone who would talk more about probation than my dad, other than maybe my brother. In addition to teach, uh, in addition to working for over 40 years in probation, he also taught for over 40 years night school at Clark University, Assumption University, and later Anna Maria College. And he took on that additional role for teaching in order to afford our educations. My mother is a teacher by trade, but she gave up that full-time profession in order to be a full-time mother to my siblings and I. Whether it's driving to Little League or basketball, taking me to in an emergency room any number of times, or getting up at 4.45 to take me to crew practice, she's always been there for me. I can't thank my parents enough for their love and support, and I certainly would not be here today if it was not for them. I'm also the proud brother of Aaron, Kara, and Terry, the three best siblings I could have asked for. I am so proud of all that they have accomplished, and I certainly would not be here without them. Counselors, I am lucky. I've had a strong support network for my entire life. Growing up in Worcester, New England's second largest city is like growing up in a small town. Believe it or not, I've had the same group of friends for my entire life. And if it for not for COVID, I am sure all of them would be here right now. Growing up, I had a strong sense of community. Whether it was raising money for my Little League Jesse Burkett, working as a dishwasher in high school at the Jewish Health Care Center, or doing community service at St. John's High School, community has always been a very important part of my life. Now as an adult, I continue to work in the Worcester community. Whether it's organizing the Canal Diggers 5K, raising money for the Mercy Center, or volunteering at my daughter's parent-teacher group, I feel like the sense of a community is a very strong attribute. Now, full confession, full confession, I have not lived in Worcester my entire life. I took a sabbatical for four years to attend St. Uh, Fordham University in New York City. And then later on, my wife and I did move shortly to a town in Holden right outside of Worcester. However, the draw of community and familiarity brought us back to Worcester. Worcester is where I also grew into the lawyer and leader that I am today. I started my legal career working as a law clerk with the judges of the Worcester Juvenile Court. I later transitioned to a Worcester law firm, Tat and Leonard and Murray, as an associate and later as a partner. While I was a general practitioner handling real estate, civil and criminal, it was juvenile law that I loved most. I handled every aspect of the juvenile law and I absolutely loved it. And that is why I accepted a position in 2010 to the Youth Advocacy Division for the Committee for Public Service, where I could focus primarily on juvenile law. It was at CPCS though that I found that I could contribute more to the community and to the litigants if I went to work with the court. And that is why in 2014, I accepted a position as assistant clerk magistrate for the Fitchburg District Court, a court that I was very familiar with. It was as an assistant that I learned how work, working in an efficient court can improve one's access to justice. In 2017, I was fortunate enough to be appointed by Chief Justice Amy Nectum as acting clerk magistrate of the Worcester Juvenile Court, where I remain to this day. Now, going over my legal career leads me to recognize some very important people in my life, people who helped me a long way. Bill Tatton and Tim Murray for teaching me how to be a lawyer. Ms. Pat Malone for giving me the opportunity of a lifetime to become an assistant clerk magistrate. Pat, you've been a friend and a mentor and a great friend, and I can't thank you enough. There's also my friend Brian DeAndrea, whose support and friendship over the years has proven significant. There's Chief Justice Amy Nectum for having faith in, in appointing me as clerk magistrate. There's Carol Erskine for her support, knowledge, and friendship for over the years. There's judges Mary Beth Keating, Anthony Murata, George Leary, Jen McNulty, Steve Bolivar, and Christopher Lacanto for all your support. I'd also like to thank my juvenile court magistrate colleagues, all their support over the years. <coughs> I think I would tell you, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. 
And I've been very fortunate during my career to work with two amazing clerk's offices, the Fitchburg District Court and the Worcester Juvenile Court. I've learned so much from working with these people and I can't thank them enough. There's also the countless attorneys and court staff over the years who've assisted me. Members of the council, I, I doubt that you will, care, you will find someone who cares more about the Worcester Juvenile Court than me. It is where I started my legal career. It's where I learned how to become an attorney. It's where I met my amazing wife. It's where I've had the honor and privilege of being the acting clerk magistrate for the last four years. And it's where I want to spend the rest of my legal profession. I know the challenges our court faces and I have plans to meet them. I also know the many strengths of our court and I know how to utilize them. I firmly believe that the juvenile court is the most important court in the Commonwealth because we deal with the most important yet vulnerable population, our children. What I love most about our court though, is we have the ability to put the puzzle pieces back together. Whether it's trying to get a juvenile offender back on track or achieving permanency for our young children, we can put families back together. If I'm fortunate enough to gain your votes, please know that I'll never take this job for granted. I will work every day to make the juvenile court better than it was when I first started. And I'll work every day to ensure our court serves everyone in a dignified and fair manner. Again, counselors, I thank you for your time and <clears throat> I'm willing and able to answer any questions you may have of me. Thank you very much, Attorney Moran. And before I turn it to the counselors, uh, I wanna make sure I'm not remiss to see if anyone is here to speak in opposition. There being none. Um, Councilor Devaney, would you like to start? Oh, thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Councilor. I really wish I could have that Hall of Fame on the wall, the diner, really. You'd, be, you'd, be, up there with, you'd be up there with great people, <laughs> Justice Hines, Justice Island, Justice Gantz, God rest his soul, a lot of people. But anyway, um, um, I first want to say that I did get a call from Brian DeAndrea. He is so disappointed he couldn't come. And, um, you know, he said you're hardworking and, um, you know, you're not someone that's going to be sitting in the office or out there, um, anyone that needs help. And I appreciated the call from him. So um, he was a great appointment. So um, tell me about your um, experience coming, your process coming here. You went to the JNC, and uh, how many of the 21 lawyers who were going to vote for you were there? I believe there was, the chairman was there in person, and then I believe there was 10 or 11 on Zoom, and I'm not sure if that had to do with um, COVID protocols or whatnot, but there I believe there was 10 or 11. How many? 10 or 11 on Zoom. 10 or 11. Okay. So at least 10 or 11 never met you, never saw you, never talked with you, and voted for you for a lifetime position. You deserve it. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying it for the public. It's wrong. Because I've been here through the years and past JNCs had 21 people there. And there was a past chairman who told the 21 members, if you don't go to a hearing, you don't vote on that nominee. So I'm not saying it for you, I'm just saying it for the public. Because as I have said, so many people think that we have so much authority. We don't have any authority. We only vote for one person. We don't know how many. So um, we look to the JNC to do their homework. And I'm clearly disappointed. Now, um, I always talk about empathy and compassion. Tell me what question the the chair of the jnc asked you i believe it was what is empathy you know what anytime he's there every nominee says he asked the first question what is your definition of empathy that's from me so, <laughs> i don't know I, I don't get it but anyway so you, you know uh so tell me um I, I like your writing. Would you tell us about that case? What case? The, the case that you have in your JNC? Uh, there's several cases. Um, like, yeah, uh, well. Was it my, oh, was it my writing sample? Oh, um, that was a uh, motion to suppress counselor on a, um, my client was charged um, with an incident at a group home and the, he was on probation at the time, counsel. So I was trying to make the argument that the um, 
one of his conditions of the probation was to follow the conditions of the of, of the group home he was at. So when the counselors brought him into a room and asked him um, what happened and started to, I use the word interrogate, I I tried to make the argument that they were agents of the, of the court. And at that point, Miranda was, should have applied because he did make admissions. Uh, right. Unfortunately, a good justice Erskine uh, denied that motion. But, yeah, no, she's great. Uh, it, you know, what a, a tribute to have all those justices to, you know, to add on today to, you know, support you. And I, I think it's your worth that your work ethic and and they've seen you grow in the job and that's it. Now, um, you did apply four years ago. Tell me about that process. Um, in September of 2017, I did apply for the clerk magistrate position of the Worcester And how County. far did you go? Uh, I made it to legal counsel. And then, okay. Um, I have to tell you, um, I volunteered for nearly a year in juvenile court for juveniles on probation. And that was the greatest experience I had because, you know, you stereotype these juveniles and you don't know the lives that they lead. And it took time to get their trust in me. I met them alone. I take them to lunch. It was all volunteer. And it made me realize how other children live. A child of a prostitute being locked in a room when the mother goes out to be abused. So all of that, it uh, it, it was, uh, I look back and I think that was the greatest experience that I have been involved in. And um, that was a while back. And so uh, I'm glad that there are some programs that have been, you know, initiated since that time, because there's a lot of them that really need that help. So, um, so you worked um, in a law practice and um, while you were in that law practice, you work for Lieutenant Governor. Well, he was your colleague, Murray. He was your yeah. colleague. Yeah. And so uh, you were his treasurer. So, um, so then what happened? They people left, and so then you moved on. D tell me about that other job because I'm not. I I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that public. Uh, oh, the Committee for Public Council Service. Yeah. So that is essentially the public defender's office for Massachusetts. And so um, they have it with, they have the public defender's unit, which is for adults. I mean, what is that under? What um, umbrella is that under? Is it just stands alone or is it under? I believe it's under the executive branch. I could be wrong, okay. um, but it's the committee for public council services. And within that committee, they have several different divisions. Uh, there's the youth advocacy advocacy division, which is what I worked in, which is representing juvenile offenders. So what made you make that decision to change from uh, being in a law practice to, to the uh... Well, some of it's tied into my wife leaving because she was actually in that office and she went work to for the public me. defender's I, office. I remember so now. There, was, there was an <laughs> opening and uh, attorney Jeff Richards, who was running the office at the time, had come to me and asked, would I be willing to interview for that open position? And as I referenced in my opening, uh, you know, juvenile law was what I loved. Uh, the real estate civil paid the bills, but it was the juvenile law that I really loved. And so when I was approached by attorney Richards, I jumped up, the, jumped up the opportunity to go work for CPCS full time. So, so then what, what inspired you to go to clerk magistrate that area? So, I mean, at that point in 2013, I had been in the court for almost 10 years and I, I saw what influence an assistant clerk could have. I dealt with mostly with assistant clerks at the time, except for clerk magistrate Malone. And I, I saw what they could do in terms of helping people, particularly prior to arraignment. And, and so when the position opened up in Fitchburg, while leaving juvenile was difficult, these jobs don't come across very, very often. And I was already familiar with district court. So I applied and, and again, um, I was very fortunate enough to get the position. Um, right. Assistant clerk. Manager. And then you went, to you went to another court. So, um, so you worked eight years in private practice, yep. right? So, um, most of it was real estate and different things. I would say about 
at least 50% of it was court appointed work, whether it be in juvenile, uh, doing care and protections or delinquencies, or district where I was in, based in Clinton, I did my bar advocate work in Clinton. So council, I'd say about 50% of it was that, and then another 50% was real estate, and then um, some civil. Right. Um, in the juvenile court, what, what you have seen, what kind of improvements would you like to make? I, I think in, in terms of Worcester specific, I'd like to see some more diversion um, programs because I think they're proven effective and we, ha we have added some diversion programs, obviously with COVID being uh, happening over the last year, we haven't been able to do many of our diversion programs. Um, so particularly on the C on the delinquency side, more diversion programs. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of the CMP side, we just gotta get cases moving quicker. These kids need permanency. And uh, you know, my role as the clerk magistrate is to make sure that the docket is reflective of um, is moving. And uh, what is your position about um, raising the age in juvenile court? Um, I'm glad we're looking at it. Um, I, you know, the science certainly suggests that in the courts now have come out with it that the adolescent, and I know we talked about this, uh, that the adolescent. Don't tell me. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but, you know, science really does suggest that the brain's not developed into the 20s, and so I think we need to look at it. Uh, there's certainly some practical concerns. Raising the age even two years, I, I don't know what that's going to do in terms of us, our ability as it currently stands to handle all those cases. We were lucky when the age was raised from 17 to 18 that we didn't have that much of an yeah, influx. That was so good. We were fortunate on that. Uh, and I would just say that the other concern is a practical concern that if you raise the age to 20, you may have 21 year olds in the same facility as a 16 year old. And I think that there's some serious safety concerns. So I'm glad that the juvenile justice reform act in 2018 addressed that. Uh, and I think it needs to be looked at. Well, you, you know, where my position is, and if 1 more person tells me, I wish I had a doll for everyone sitting in that chair that's told me that the brain doesn't develop till 25 and my brain was fully developed and I chose to have 4 children before I was 25. Okay, so that's my argument and I'm sticking to it. Okay. <laughs> now, um, I can tell you uh, on another note, personally, um, I didn't go to college until after I had 4 children. My husband got a loan in any way. Um, the most difficult course I had was child psychology, simply for what you said, what's on a paper, what's in a book, okay? And the, uh, and the professor said that mothers talk more to their, their, their infant girls than their infant boys. Biggest mistake I made, I raised my hand and I said, you know what? I got two boys, I have two boys and two girls and I talked their ears off. They had no sex, they were babies. And she got me after class, she says, I don't want you in my class anymore because that's what's in the book. So I never commented again. It was so difficult because all the exams, I had to clear my life experience and try to think, what does she want? And that's what I had to do. So that's the same thing with the 25 years. So. I'm sticking to my opinions. <laughs> Certainly you can, Counselor. But anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, so I do want to go over some of the, the things that we talked about in, in your cases. And, um, you know, they have been, um, and they have been diverse. What was the most um, rewarding results you had in a case? So I, I think it would be the one I reference. It's it's a CRA, and I use her initial CD. Um, and she was a young girl I was appointed to represent back in 2007. In fact, it was just when the Worcester Juvenile Court had opened. Uh, the new courthouse had opened, and Juvenile Court was the only court in the courthouse at the time. And without getting into too much detail, she was uh, a young girl, maybe 12 at the time, struggling. She was with a guardian. Her parents were really not involved. Uh, if I remember service correctly, I think they were both drug addicted. And so she was struggling. And so she came in on a chins at the time, now a CRA, and the guardian was just looking for help. And so I, I remember sitting with her alone for maybe an hour going over what a stubborn child was. And um, it, it was a difficult conversation because she was dysregulating at the time. Um, but I can tell you, I represented CD from the time from 2017 and uh, 2007 into 2013. During that time, she must have been in a half a dozen group homes. 
Uh, unfortunately, she did pick up some delinquencies, so she then went from group homes to DYS back into the community. Eventually, she was committed to the Department of Youth Services. Uh, I, I attended the, the hearing and then obviously visited her until she aged out at 18. The reason why I put her in there is because I think she's reflective of the re rehabilitation that we can do for our kids. And I, I mentioned this to you, Counselor, because yeah. about two years ago, I was walking down Main Street in Worcester down near City Hall and I got a cat call from across the street and it was her. And it was only about a 10 to 15 minute conver it's second conversation, but in that 10 to 15 seconds, I could tell that she was an EMT and she was doing really well. And, and this was a girl who struggled. And, you know, I, I'm sure she's gonna have some struggles for the rest of her life, but for a kid who was in and out of our system for three or four years and hasn't reoffended and is now an EMT, I, I would consider that a success story. Um, and she's a kid who never gave up. Right, yeah. And you know, don't realize some of these, you know, I, I have a friend and young man, he's uh, probably a 40 now. He spent his entire life in foster homes. There's, you know, there's so many of people out there that a lot of people don't even know, you know. Now the, um, yeah, some of the ones, I don't want to be repetition on that one, but um, you, um, You represent represented a, a child and it was um and it is rep in and it was a six year old regarding a chin's petition. And um she was twelve and then uh, when you began your representation, she was twelve years old and he had lived with her guardian and her biological sister. And it and it goes downhill from there. And um you know I've said it a lot of times, and and I, I I'm not a fan of the Department of Children and Family, and um, you have had attorneys representing them in in different cases, so um, you know, tell me about that. There there was one that um, really was fighting the, you know, the family uh, department. And, and how you intervene and how you represented her. Well, I think the one we talked about, uh, counsel at our meeting was, um, I was appointed to represent a young man who was in the permanent custody of DCF. His mom's rights were terminated a few years before um, I was appointed to represent him. And it was, a, I wasn't a part of the trial, but it was a contentious trial. And there was a lot of animosity afterwards. And my client was older in age and he essentially Fought any home he was going to go into, not physically, but just he didn't want to be adopted, and mm -hmm. he made that clear. And so the the department had a very difficult time uh, trying to find a home for him. Subsequent to the termination, uh, mom kind of got her life back together. Uh, her opinion of the department really didn't change in terms of her animosity towards them, um, but she did get her life back together. So when he was about sixteen, uh, I worked with the mother to pitch and. Actually, I think he was 17 at the time. My, my apologies. But anyway, he was 17. We, I worked with the mother to petition the court because that's what he wanted for the mother to become guardian. Because even though her rights were terminated, she stands in the same place as anyone else who, was, who wants to achieve guardianship. So uh, I did work with a DCF attorney at the time who's now retired. He was a very good guy, and he kind of took over the case later. And we were able to work out a, a, a situation where by the time he turned 18, he was having unsupervised visits with his mother. We didn't achieve guardianship. Uh, I don't think we thought we were going to achieve guardianship, but uh, at the end, when he aged out, he had a, a relationship with his mother. Uh, and my understanding is they were living together at the last I heard. Um, there was an attorney from the Department of um, Children and Families, and you were representing the father of a young man. Now, is that repetitious that I'm talking about that particular one? And that was. Um, uh, there was a, a department psychologist that was involved and and um, oh, evaluation yes. and the juvenile. Uh, that was a, a trial I was a part of where a representative father who had a very limited IQ, um, loved his daughter, uh, his son, my apologies, visited the child every week, did everything on the service plan. And, um, but because of his limited uh, cognitive ability and some sus suspicions of uh, 
legal activity. The department did not want to place the child with him. So we did go to trial uh, and it was a two part trial because at the end of the first part that uh, I was able to um, show that the department's uh, psychologist was using um, outdated pathology. And I, I was able to prove that by bringing in another psychologist so that the trial was sus suspended for about a year and during which time my client was reevaluated. Um, unfortunately, the second time around, um, there was sufficient evidence to terminate his rights, but we were able to come up with an open adoption agreement. So, um, when the judge terminates the parental rights, how about adoption? Does that come in? Is, did that happen? In this particular case, there was an open adoption agreement. And so, the open adoption agreement allows the parent, for, well, first and foremost, the open adoption agreement gives permanency to the child. Uh, but what it also does is it allows the biological parent to maintain some form of relationship with the child. And we were able to achieve that with uh, the gentleman I referenced in my mm -hmm. application. So, um, we talk about age, juvenile court, district court. You, you did have someone uh, who was first in the well, was transferred from the district court to the juvenile court and it because it occurred before he was 18 and he was charged with the rape of a child. So how did that go? That, that so that was a situation where um, you correct. Um, I don't know how it happened, but he was initially reigned in district court. And then about a week after the arraignment, my office got the phone call from our district court office saying, um, he actually should have been arraigned in, dis in juvenile court. So he, he was, the case was transferred to juvenile court. Uh, I was appointed to represent him. And um, again, he's a, he's a kid like many of the other kids in and out of the system for most of his life. Um, and well, it made it more complicated because it was a stepsister and was. there was a lot of antagonism. There it was. The and, and generally, you know, when you're dealing with juveniles, you do rely heavily on the parents. And in this particular case, I couldn't do that because there was, some animosity. I don't believe his biological, if I remember correctly, counsel, I don't think his biological mother was around. I was dealing with his biological father and his stepmother. Um, so he was a kid though, that I really kind of had to take on, particularly after commitment. Most of the time after commitment, um, you kind of let DYS take over, but because there was no support network, I, I, I did maintain a relation, um, representation of him for at least two years after the commitment. Well, well it did have a happy ending, didn't it? Uh, I hope so, because he hasn't reoffended. So, and um, yeah, um, and you were there when he got his diploma. So that's good. You really follow up on these people. That that shows compassion, which which is important to me. What about the one that um, he wasn't shown his uh, Miranda rights? That that oh, that was the one I referenced in my. Um... That was my written statement, uh, my written uh, motion that I attached where I tried to make a, a legal argument about uh, uh, the uh, worker at the program being an agent for the state and it um, right. wasn't and, successful. Yeah, um, yeah the, this, I, I don't know how you want to be in a juvenile court. I, I don't think I'd be able to sleep at night really with some of these cases. You really have to let it go, don't you? Because there's um there's no happy endings for a lot of these situations. It's tough, counselor, but I, I really do believe we do more good more good than. Well, you know, it, from my little experience, I saw that, and it, you know, and, and I felt helpless because was I couldn't change the situation. But the the sad thing is that that juvenile is um, looked at uh, with disdain from people because they don't know why you know she or he has that attitude or whatever so um you know we need someone with compassion and empathy like you provide you know but um so what was the most um disappointing result of an all your legal experience in clerk magistrate experience most disappointing yeah I don't know if I can give a specific example about most disappointing. I can tell you it's disappointing sometimes, um, you, you know, when you're at a magistrate level, you have a hearing and you give a kid an opportunity. And, and so you continue at the clerk's level for a certain period of time, and then you see them back in two to three months. I mean, I, I would say counsel, that's the most disappointing, um, particularly for some of these kids where they, you know, they just, you know, they can't get out of their own way and 
So I think that that would be the most disappointing when you give a kid a break and then they're back two or three times after that. It always bothers me that they send them back to a home where they are being physically abused. Why does that happen? I don't understand, but they do, you know? So, um, so in, in your experience, what, what do you, what do you see uh, as a, a value, some program that has, since you've been at the job that helps, um, helps these juveniles? Is there any uh, program out there that? Oh, there's uh, a number of programs out there. There's a I mean, lot of them, I know. But I mean, uh, I'm talking about, you know, the child that, you know, is has to be sent to the home where, you know, the father is abusive. You know, how how do you intervene? How, you know, it's not always successful to remove the child. No, um, and I think as a clerk, you know, we rely heavily on the collaterals in terms of. Us, I know that the, you know, whether it's DYS, if the kids committed to DYS, DCF, uh, we also reach out to biological family. I mean, you know, to see if they could take the child. Um, so we also rely on our GALs and our court investigators to go out and to investigate to ensure that these kids are safe. Um, so, um, so you follow up on these. It, it, these take years sometimes, right? To get. I, I, Yes, I mean, well, with the magistrate hearings, I try, I, 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 they generally don't take years. I mean, I, I think that in my personal opinion, you know, if you continue a magistrate hearing for a certain period of time, it defeats the purpose. So, um, generally speaking, my magistrate hearings are continued for three to six months because after six months, counselor, if something happens, it's very difficult to locate the victim at that point or proceed. So, um, I try to keep my hearings to admit, um, the length of time I continue a matter to three to six months. Are you, um, are you seeing them in person or are they Zoom or what are they? Right doing? now they're Zoom. Yeah, see that bothers me because to me you have to look someone straight in the eye like we are and body language and all of that, you know? It's not ideal, but we're getting by and. Um, uh, we have no choice really, you know? But um, so uh, how much is drugs, you know, involved in these cases that you've had? So I would say, particularly with the CMPs, a lot. You know, a lot of our parents coming in are either, um, you know, have substance abuse issues, often hand in hand with some mental health issues. Um, so it plays a lot. Uh, I, I think for our juveniles, there is marijuana use, prescription drug use, um, and so we see it every day. It, you know, it, this whole pandemic. To me, um, I've said it publicly and I've said it to the administration. I'm concerned about child abuse because they're not going out in the homes. They're not seeing these people. And in, Jan in January, the children and family uh, people have all got their vaccines. And yet only they've only gone into the homes 46% since January. And that concerns me. It, because um, we read in the paper about an autistic boy and they went out and saw him and he had some gouges on his face and the mother said he did it himself. He ended up dying. Okay, so he was killed. So uh, th those are the things that bother me. And because it, if, um, if you see that, then you act. You don't take it for granted that that person is, is being truthful. And, and that's, I guess that's my objection about the Department of children and families, because so many times they close the book, you know, a seven-year-old is being stabbed to death by the, this was true, uh, by the father, and he was the weight of a year old. How do you say, oh, they're doing the best they can? But that's what's happening. So, in, in domestic violence, too. I mean, you know, I keep saying to the Lieutenant Governor, Governor, would you announce a, a phone number for people to call. We can't help the babies at home, but we could help those in domestic violence situations. You know, we have people that have mental issues. You know, how do you deal with people with mental issues? I mean, you had one, thank God it, it, it was resolved and he was adopted and everything, but there's a lot of people out there that, you know, that have these children in their custody and they have mental problems. See many of that? course, counselor every day and I think you just, you just have to be patient with them and understand where they're coming from um, and you know as a practicing attorney I would work to get them assistance whether it be through counseling or evaluations but it, from the clerk's office perspective um, if they come to the counter you just gotta you have to be patient with them um, 
try to point them in the right direction. Well, I, I've got to tell you, you had wonderful witnesses. I go back 20 years, but um, in, in to have all those people supporting you, uh, that's quite a tribute. We don't hear that list of all the judges. So um, I, I'm very glad with your appointment. I'm glad you got through. Um, just one, just one other uh, case about the man that was married to three women. I mean, that that was. I mean, I've never seen one like that. So I represented a young girl. Um, she was a newborn, and her mother. She was born drug addicted. The mother really wasn't in the picture after the case. Um, dad was. Uh, and dad, by all accounts, was doing what he needed to do. Uh, Mom subsequently had a second child. I was I was appointed to represent both daughters at that point. Sometime into the case, the social worker had pulled me aside and said, "Hey, listen, we're, we're kind of concerned because um, you know we think dad's got a lot of women coming in. We don't know if he's marrying them for immigration status." So, just on a hunch, I went down to Worcester City Hall and I pulled a marriage certificate, and he had been married within the last year. And then I knew that he had some ties to Rhode Island, so I took a trip down to Rhode Island and pulled two more marriage certificates. And he was married, I think. And again, I don't remember the time frame, counselor, but um, he we did find out that he was married to three different women at the same time. And obviously, that among other things contributed to uh, the, the both girls being free for adoption. And again, you talk about success stories; they were put in an amazing home. I, I mean, we're talking about a six-day-old baby that you know that. They took from the mother. I mean, it, it, I mean, I can't even imagine these cases. What happens to that baby? Well, again, uh, with those two girls, there was a success story because they were placed in an amazing pre-adoptive home that became a permanent, permanent home, or as we call, forever home. Well, you know, I, I could keep you forever on this. I and I enjoyed talking with you and and. Um, and learning about you and your family and everything. So I appreciate that time. Uh, know you, you've earned it the old fashioned way. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, you have been appointed and um, I wish you all success in the position. Thank you very much, Councilor. Thanks again for all the time. You have to come back. I will. Thank you for the waffles. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor. Uh, and Attorney Moran, I'm gonna uh, call a recess on this hearing because Lieutenant Governor's here for our assembly vote. Thank you. I am in the car, Councillor. We just finished our, our press of ale. I want to call our assembly to order uh, this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And I recognize Councillor Kennedy for our afternoon. prayer and our pledge today. Just ask that we take a moment of silence for all the victims of this terrible pandemic. I'll pray for continued quick vaccination of all citizens. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. I recognize Councilor Pereira for a motion to record advice and consent for the financial warrant. So moved, Governor. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 I recognize Councilor Ionella for a motion to record advice and consent for the pending list of notaries, public and justices of the peace. So moved. Second. second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 I recognize Councillor Hurley for a motion to record advice and consent for the appointment of Dana S. Doyle to the position of Associate Justice of the Probate and Family Court. It's with pleasure that I put forth, that I put forth the nomination of Dana Doyle. I think she's been doing an excellent job. Uh, she's from the Pittsfield area. Um, in the time that I've been a counselor, I never forget about the Berkshires. And we have a lot of talent, and when it's from the Berkshires, we get them on the bench. So thank you. So moved. Second. Second. There's a motion, and I hear a second. Second. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. We may begin. We may begin the roll call. Councilor Jubinville? Yes. Councilor Devaney? Yes. Councilor Ionella? Yes. Councilor Duff? Councilor Duff? Eileen? Councilor Duff? He said yes. Yeah, said yeah. We need your vote, Eileen. Councillor Duff, can you hear us? We can see Eileen. you. And it, looks, it looks like your microphone is green from the screen. Councillor Duff. I think she said yes. Well, okay, we'll confirm. I, I'm on the phone with Eileen. There's something wrong with her computer. She just for she's frozen. So it's but I'm going to put her on speaker. Go ahead, Eileen. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they heard and you. We, we will verify that directly with Eileen in a conversation. Okay. We can continue the roll call. Yes. Councilor Kennedy. Councilor Kennedy. Yes. Councilor DePaulo. Yes. Councilor Hurley. With pleasure. Yes. Councilor Ferreira. Yes. Ado Governor. Okay. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you appreciate your attention to our assembly matters today and I know you have a hearing underway. Uh, thank you very much. We can now. <laughs> we, can now. We, will, we will confirm your vote. Uh, we heard I'm, you. I'm voting yes. Okay, very good. And we've voting now confirmed yes. your I vote. seem to be frozen. Okay, you're unfrozen. So mm -hmm. we understand you have a hearing underway. Thank you all very much for your hard work and uh, be safe and be healthy. Same to you. Same deal. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. That doesn't help. And with that, uh, we'll reconvene Thank the hearing. I can't, I can't. Uh, welcome back, Councillor Duff. We're glad to be able to hear you. Uh, Councilor Ionella, I'll turn to you for uh, questions uh, for the nominee. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear, hear me? me? Yes. We can, Councilor. Yes. I don't have uh, any questions. Uh, can you hear the me? Nominee... Yes. <laughs> the, the nominee made a good presentation, uh, and I think he'll be a great addition uh, to the Worcester Juvenile yes. Court. I look forward to voting for him next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and I'll turn to Councillor Ferreira next for questions for the nominee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I echo the sentiments of uh, Councillor Ionella. I did get a call from my Worcester judge who uh, used to live in my district who said when she went out there to uh, work in the juvenile court that uh, the nominee was terrific and actually educated her in a lot of matters. I spoke to uh, Clerk Brian DeAndre over there in Worcester. He has great high regard for him as well. Um, I think he's going to make a magnificent clerk. I think uh, the juvenile court is one of the most important yes, courts yes, in Powell. Yes. <laughs> and I keep hearing uh, Councillor Duff saying yes, yes, yes. I'm not sure if she's agreeing with me or saying something to someone else. But um, in any event, the, uh, you do have my support next week. And um, I love your, your witnesses, including Judge Malone. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferreira. Councillor Duff, there's some kind of delay going on, but do we have you right now? No. Um, Councillor Juvenville, do you have questions for the nominee? Councillor Juvenville, we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. I got it. Can you hear me? We can now. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Uh, 
I got a call from uh, Jen McNulty, the judge, and uh, Paul Flanagan, who's finishing up his 41st year in the juvenile court. And uh, they had uh, a lot of good things to say to you. I, I think your dedication to the uh, juvenile court is really unmatched. And you got to be dedicated to that court to make it work. You fit all the criteria as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be glad to vote for you next week. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. And I'll just ask again so that we catch you when it's working. Councillor Duff, are you there right now? Okay, we'll go to Councillor Hurley. Yeah, Apologies. thank you. Councillor Hurley. Thank you, Councillor DePaul. I've been in phone communication with Councillor Duff. She's gonna try and call in because she's frozen, she can't hear. It's yeah, right. whatever's going on, it's a mess. But back to that issue at hand. Um, we spoke on the phone and um, you have a stellar reputation. I have a question for you. When I was in practice, when I first started out, I did juvenile district superior probate. And when I had a juvenile case, it ruined my whole schedule because you went in there for nine o'clock and sometimes you didn't get heard or called in till 1230 because if the public doesn't know, a juvenile case is something that is heard separate and apart from the rest of the people who are there for juvenile matters on that day. So if you got Johnny, Joey, Susie, and um, Mary, those other three wait in the hall or in the waiting area, depending on what court, and then you go in for the hearing that you're there for without anybody else from the public being able to see or hear anything. And I finally made a determination that for the, the good of my sanity and my practice, I would not do juvenile law anymore um, because of the tremendous amounts of time that you just sat and waited. What, and I think it's still that way pretty much now. I did one favor for one friend uh, maybe three years ago, and it didn't seem to me that much had changed. What would you do to make the changes to make it more palatable and more reasonable for a practitioner um, to represent a client in a juvenile matter and not have to wait there for four hours doing nothing. So, certainly, Counselor, and, and someone who has experienced that as a practitioner myself, I can certainly understand your frustration. Um, I can tell you a couple of things I've done in the last four years, uh, one of which is really look at case limits. Uh, I, I can't speak to, you know, Hamden County or Berkshire County, but I can speak to Worcester that there were times where when I first got to Worcester Juvenile would have 130 cases on one particular day and the next day you may have 30. And so one of the first things I did was institute case limits. And, and the reason why I think that might help some of your problem counselors, if you have less cases on a particular day, it will limit the wait time. Um, the other thing we did is, I know it may not seem like a lot, but we historically had a 930 call the list in Worcester Juvenile. Uh, I, I, we moved that up to nine o'clock during my time in the Worcester Juvenile Court. I, I think going forward, Zoom presents some options for us, uh, particularly on the pretrial level, where if we're not looking at a disposition, uh, we, I've already talked to the judges about having a Zoom court going forward, which would allow the practitioner maybe to be in the office uh, in, in or in another court uh, counsel. We've actually had uh, attorneys Zoom in outside of a courtroom. Uh, it certainly would help the parents. They wouldn't have to take off a day of work. Uh, a child wouldn't have to take off a whole day of school. So I, I think one of the benefits that we've had over the last year is we've learned to adapt. And I, I think Zoom, at least for Worcester Juvenile, is here to stay. And I think that this would alleviate some of your concerns about the wait time. Well, well, I, like I said, I gave up juvenile practice and I just went in because on that one matter because the person was unrepresented and my friend was a wreck. Um, and I basically said to the judge, I'm just here to get a court appointed lawyer for this person. I'm not doing this case. I haven't been in juvenile court in 25 years. And, you know, it's just for all the people who 
are good enough to to practice in the juvenile court. Um, and the other courts as well, you know, why don't you have floating um, times given for arraignments in district court so that you're not all there at nine o'clock for the cattle call that, and then you sit there until 10 30, 11 o'clock. Um, so I think that hopefully that that's going to be a big major change in all of the courts. In the meantime, however, um, I think the thing that the things that you've implemented are very good. Um, I think you're going to do a great job, and I intend to vote for you next week. So thank you very much. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor Duff. Can you hear me now? Oh, we're so happy to be able to hear you, <laughs> Counselor Duff. You can go ahead. <laughs> the challenges of technology. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I live on an island, as you may know, in Gloucester, so sometimes we have these challenges. But um, great to see you. Great hearing. Um, I won't I won't belabor some of this, but um, I love what you've just said to Council Hurley about using technology because it does enable people to participate in the criminal justice system in a way they haven't really fully been able to before, simply as what you've just said, they don't have to take a whole day off from work um, if if they can come in a different way. So to me, that's a huge social justice issue because it indeed is access to justice. Um, so the juvenile court is is so critically important, as you know, and thank you for your work in it, um, particularly with CPCS, a, a very under, um, I think understaffed, underfunded agency. I think the work that the attorneys are doing there is Herculean and I appreciate it. Um, but some of the issues, you know, that I care a lot about, and I think they, they dovetail in the juvenile court a little bit differently are, um, for instance, the LGBTQ community and you know, in my experience, what I've learned is that there are a lot of kids who are part of this community who don't feel safe at home and many don't feel safe in foster home and they end up on the streets and they end up, um, you know, in trouble, maybe prostituting themselves, maybe becoming pregnant, maybe, you know, carrying venereal diseases. And it's it's tragic. It's an act to me in, in the United States, um, just a tragedy. And so have you, can you share any of your um, experiences of working with this particular community? Certainly, uh, Counselor. Um, in, I, I think one of the things we, we have to do, particularly in the court and when I did as attorneys, try to make these kids as comfortable as possible. Um, because as you mentioned, a lot of them are coming from difficult circumstances. Um, you, you know, in terms of court, one of the things we try to do is, however they identify, that's how we identify them in court. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we make sure that it's on the folder. Uh, obviously, legally, we have to go by their name just for purposes of the court, but we do identify them by whatever name they identify themselves as. And, um, you know, you and I had the conversation. Unfortunately, a lot of these kids are coming from group homes and they're yeah. struggling. Um, DYS is struggling. You know, they're trying to do right by these kids. And uh, it, it's difficult because... I don't know if there's a plan yet, you know, in terms of how to really effectively deal with them. And I think many of them are being ostracized by their home and we don't have that support network. And so oftentimes these kids are coming into court with a DYS caseworker or a social worker and no parent. And so uh, I, I think you need to take that into account, particularly as a magistrate, when you're dealing with the disposition um, in terms of where these kids have come from. Yeah, and it, it's... It's interesting to me because, um, as I've said so many times, it doesn't absolve someone of committing a crime, but the special circumstances under which they live their life um, does m m impact their decisions at times. And and the science does tell us that the brain is not fully formed until at least the age of 25. Now, that doesn't mean many of us haven't done many, many <laughs> grown up things before the age of 25, but science is science. And, and that's just, that's the truth of it. Um, and so the, the, the care and protection of juveniles into any vulnerable community is, um, the onus is really on us as adults and as elected officials. 
Um, how about folks um, in that are cognitively disabled, maybe on the spectrum? Um, have you had experiences with that community in your in your work? Quite frequently, counselor, both as a practice, a practitioner, and certainly as a um, as a magistrate. And again. I think particularly as a magistrate, in, we would deal with these uh, juveniles mostly at the magistrate level. Uh, in, in, you know, a common example may be, um, you know, a young person struggling at school and they get assaultive uh, and they end up getting an assault and battery charge or something else and they're before me at a magistrate hearing. The, the key thing is to have those supports in place and, 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 and I sometimes have to rely on uh, the collaterals to tell me, because as as probably most of the counselors know here, you have some kids who are high function, uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not still struggling. And so I obviously rely heavily on, on the collaterals to try to tell me what's in, what services are in place, um, mm -hmm. what the plan is going forward. But as I told you, counsel, when we had talked, you know, one thing I learned from CPCS is, you know, everyone has a story, and so I, I need to make sure I know that story before I make a disposition. That, that's I, I applaud you for that because I think that's a great way of um, of looking at this work is that everyone does have a story that they they carry with them, which informs what decisions they make and all, as many times how they are in the world. And there are some folks who've grown up in the system who are real heroes among us who have um, been a able to succeed and, and become, uh, you know, lawyers and doctors and teachers and uh, mechanics and all kinds of other things. And they really, I don't think that we often as a society acknowledge um, what they've been through because we really don't want to talk about it. You know, I think a lot of these issues are things to be frank, we don't really want to talk about because they're hard. It's hard when you listen about kids being in, you know, like Council Devaney says, being in group homes and being abused sexually or physically or mentally or spiritually. And it happens. I mean, it just happens. Um, so what what do you think will be your biggest challenge on the bench? I think going forward right now, we're obviously going to be dealing with COVID for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this time last year, we were only hearing maybe a handful of cases a day, and that creates a backlog. Uh, so in terms of being a clerk magistrate, my job over the next six months to a year is to make sure uh, we get the cases heard, right. um, whether it be, you know, on the delinquency side, you know, we, we these kids deserve to have some kind of final disposition. Victims deserve to be safe and know that the mm -hmm. conditions of court are out there. On the CMP side, we got to get these kids permanency. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it's not ideal, uh, but we we've been doing trials via Zoom, and 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 we're we're getting the hang of it. Uh, I I think everyone welcomes the day where we can start bringing people back into court in Absolutely. a safe manner. In a safe manner, uh, but that's going to be my biggest job over the next year is getting these cases heard. Right. What can we do to help? What can the governor's council do? Council do. Honestly, <laughs> you guys are hitting home runs right now in terms of your appointments. Could continue to appoint good people um, and people who recognize the challenges that we face as uh, court personnel over the next year. Uh, and again, good people. And I think we've seen that so far. How but about think, funding? We could always use funding. Certainly. Um, <laughs> I don't say that about the trial court, so to speak, counsel. I say it more about, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, the resources out there. Mm -hmm. We only have one facility right now for kids who are committed under Section 35 for alcohol right. substance abuse. Uh, group homes are closing. You know, we don't have enough beds. And so, and I know this, and, and, and to, to be quite honest, this administration has been doing a great job of it. And, and, and we're kind of, it's, it's, we're a victim of the times right now. So. Uh, the more money we can put towards the social services part, particularly the uh, preventative measures, because unfortunately, oftentimes when families come to us, they're already at a point where they're, it's a breaking point. So, yeah. um, and again, I think this council and this administration has already been doing a great job. Well, I think, we, I, I think we're doing okay. Um, and thank you for saying we're great. We're okay. Um, we can always do better. Uh, children are the most important natural resource that we have. And um, it's it's 
you know, it's a very complex, challenging thing. But to your point, we don't have enough of the specialty um, facilities, homes and folk, places like that for, for our youth. Um, anyway, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed speaking to you before, and um, I think you will do very well in this position. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Councillor Kennedy. Um, I received a number of calls about qualifications. You and I have known each other for several years. How long have you been the acting clerk there? Uh, it's January 2017, so a little over 17. So you're in your fourth year as acting clerk? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, do you think you can, you'll be able to do the job if we actually give you the title? Yes, it's just going to be a little different. Can I can start putting stuff up on the walls? That's the running joke. I haven't I, put anything up. I think up. that's about the difference because you've been doing it for, you're yeah. in your fourth year doing it. So it almost seems silly that you haven't been appointed uh, earlier. Um, and I hear you're doing a great job there as well. I, I congratulate Councillor Hurley on um, her wisdom in uh, deciding not to do juvenile court cases. Because every time I take one, which isn't very often, it's usually a youthful offender case. Um, I show up at the juvenile court, it's like falling into the abyss. I just can't get out of there. Everything takes forever. Um, and I, I'm used to a fast pace, moving things in court type thing, you know, uh, getting in and out, jumping to another court. I, so I congratulate her for that. I wish I had her wisdom. Um, no, you're, you're doing a great job out there. There's no reason to fix what's not broken. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. Uh, Attorney Moran, congratulations again on your nomination. Thank you. Um, glad to have you here today. And I just have a couple questions for you. First of all, um, thank you for serving this population. Um, it's so critical and uh, I appreciate having nominees uh, who've been through CPCS. I think that's a very important perspective. So I also have a daughter in fourth grade. She's been uh, schooling all remote since about this time last year until a couple weeks ago, she started going uh, in person. Um, how do you think the remote education um, has impacted the population that we tend to see going through juvenile court? It has. A so I'll put it this way. First of all, I think, and I can only speak to Worcester Public Schools, I think they're doing the best they can in terms of servicing and educating our kids. Uh, obviously, in, hybrid's not ideal, uh, you know, and, and we see it with our own daughter, you know, the lack of socialization, um, particularly over the last year, it's, it's hurt. Um, and certainly, you know, we've been fortunate enough that we've been able to send her to alternative education, you know, an alternative environment so she can still socialize uh, with kids. Uh, so, from the court's perspective, the kids are struggling right now. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's some mental health stuff that's not being addressed. Uh, I, I think um, the lack of socialization, I think we're better than we were six months ago, certainly. Um, but the kids are struggling right now. Yeah, and um, of the hats I wear, one of them is I teach a couple classes at a therapeutic high school for kids with social emotional disabilities, kids who are experienced or have experienced trauma. Um, and a lot of them have been to juvenile court and a lot of them live in group homes. Um, and what I've seen is these are kids who, uh, in many cases, their lives just fell apart when school stopped because they don't attend remotely. Uh, many of them don't have access to technology. Uh, many of them, we take for granted that children know their way around technology, but many from disadvantaged backgrounds don't actually. Um, and so there's an access issue there. And then of course, Unfortunately, for a lot of these kids, school is the one place where they have stability in their life and where there's adults who are caring for them. Um, and so I have a great concern about how that trauma over the past year is gonna manifest itself as it compounds with other traumas. Um, would you agree that um, kids who experience complex childhood trauma, that that tends uh, to manifest at the onset of puberty and through adolescence in sometimes aggressive and certainly um, dysregulated behavior? 
Yes. I mean, I start with my own clients. Uh, and certainly we see it on a regular basis in the juvenile court, probably on a daily basis, particularly with our uh, kids on the delinquency side. Um, so in my setting, uh, both as an attorney, actually, and, and an educator, um, I, I've had, I've had teenagers swear at me and tell me off, um, and be wildly disrespectful. Um, and it's coming from a place that I like to think isn't directed at me, that it's coming from a place of their background experience. Um, have you ever had that experience of a child? Yes. Being wildly disrespectful. How would you react as a clerk? If that were to happen before you, well, it depends certainly on the circumstances. Um, I, I don't think showing aggression back or anger back. You want to be as even tempered as possible in dealing with the the young person who's showing aggression. Uh, try to calm them down as much as possible. Um, I I try to handle it one on one. If the parents there, I try to have the parent intervene. I've been fortunate enough not to have those. Many examples, I like to think that maybe that's because I'm a reasonable person at the clerk's level, mm -hmm. uh, but it has happened and you, you need to remain calm um, and you, 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 you can't show anger back. Um, and uh, obviously, if necessary, you know, you can get the parent involved. If the attorney's there, you could get the attorney involved. Um, unfortunately, if it does rise to the level, the court officers would get involved at that point. But um, it depends on the circumstance because kids can be angry. And kids can be frustrated. And again, it goes back to what I said to Consul Duff. It's, you know, you got to know what the kid's story is. Um, one thing that I don't think came up in our earlier conversations, but you attended St. John's Shrewsbury, is that correct? So uh, I attended Shrewsbury High, so I hold nothing against you on that. <laughs> um, but uh, I do know that at Shrewsbury High, if a child acted that way when I was there, at least, um, they might be suspended, maybe. They might get a detention. At the therapeutic high school uh, where I teach part time now, um, a child would be given a, a timeout and they'd be asked to engage in some level of restorative justice, write a letter of apology, own their behavior, accept responsibility, things like that. Um, and it happens uh, daily, I can assure you. So I wanted to just uh, point out uh, a law that you're aware of, Mass General Law, Chapter 119, Section 53. Um, and to focus on the part that states the care, custody, and discipline of the children brought before the court shall approximate as nearly as possible that which they should receive from their parents, and that as far as practicable, they shall be treated not as criminals, but as children in need of aid, encouragement, and guidance. And I, certainly you'll follow that law, but also you appreciate it and, and you agree uh, that it's just. Um, so just recently, the SJC came down with a decision, Commonwealth uh, versus uh, Yulani Yu, a juvenile and another, um, and you're familiar uh, with that decision? I am. So in that case, uh, a child pulled off the judge in a wildly disrespectful way. Um, and the response was um, a DYS commitment for 90 days. Um, and this was a child who uh, engaged in the exact behavior I just mentioned, wrote a letter of apology, owned her uh, situation, uh, pleaded for another chance. Um, do you think that was an appropriate decision by that judge? So I guess I'll start off by saying that I wasn't there on that particular day, so I can't tell exactly what went down with the courtroom, certainly. Um, and I, the judge has to stand by the decision. Um, I, I would say that would I have handled it differently? Quite possibly. Um, Again, I wasn't there, but given my history, I might have probably handled it a little differently. But again, I, I, I don't. The SJC presented their facts. I don't know what else was in the briefs in sure. terms of what else other information was out there. Um, but to answer your question, honestly, I probably would have handled it differently. It seems to me that folks, uh, regardless of profession, uh, in positions of authority can sometimes uh, develop an ego that they take umbrage when they're disrespected. And I think in juvenile court, it's especially important that um, that's controlled and, and actually from our conversations, I trust that you, you are that kind of person. Um, as far as, and this is my last area of questioning, um, as far as racial disparities in the criminal system, um, we all know about uh, the Harvard study and how the charging phase and the sentencing phase are where we tend to see that, um, in the district and superior courts. But I, I firmly believe in that it starts in the juvenile courts, um, for a lot of kids. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, 
Do you believe that there are racial disparities in the juvenile court across the Commonwealth? Um, and do you believe that there's implicit bias uh, within the system that plays a role in that? I think statistics show that there, there is inequity. Um, and one of the things I'm proud of is being on the mayor's youth gang violence task force initiative. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we do is it's a, it's kind of across the board, um, agency. We have DCF involved. We have the police department involved. We have the courts involved. We have representatives from Clark university, uh, social services, community involvement. And one of the things I do counselor as the clerk is I, I want to be as transparent as possible with our statistics. Uh, as far as juvenile court goes, I have nothing to hide. I, I, I stand by my decisions and, um, you know, if we, if we can do better, I'm more than willing to sit down. I, 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 I don't want to be a court where it's known as, uh, an unfair court. I want to give everyone a fair shake in terms of implicit bias. I think we have to deal with that on a daily basis. Uh, the trial court does offer trainings routinely on the implicit bias. Mm -hmm. And, um, I always have to be mindful of that in my, in my own dealings. And as I comment to almost every nominee, it's not that Worcester Juvenile Court or Worcester County right. is facing this in particular. It's a it's a systemic thing that we all deal with. And um, so I'll leave it at that. As far as um, Central Massachusetts and Worcester, uh, in particular, if you like, uh, to your knowledge, how many um, non-white judges or clerk magistrates are there in Worcester Juvenile? In Worcester County. Are there many? Don't think so. It's not a trick question. Sorry. But um, to me, one of the reasons is um, that we, as a bar community, need to do a better job of mentoring and, and recruiting um, attorneys of color um, and encouraging them to, to get to the point where you're at. Because I know from, uh, certainly from the phone calls I received and from your statements, you have, you've had mentors who have helped you through that. No question. And I'm wondering if, as clerk magistrate, you would commit yourself to um, to mentoring young attorneys, uh, and in particular, but not exclusively attorneys of color. Is that something that you'd make a commitment to do? No question. Um, attorney Moran, I'm, I'm very impressed with your background and the work you've done. I appreciate your, um, compassion for the clients you've served and, and the work you've done in the juvenile court. Uh, and I'm going to be very happy to present your name for the council's consideration, uh, at our next assembly. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Counselors. Thank you everyone. Uh, and with that, this hearing of the Governor's Council is closed.